What advice would you uh, give to aspiring authors, and um, let's limit it to fiction for now, because mm -hmm. I feel like non-fiction is a whole different mm -hmm. um, ball game, especially um, authors of African descent mm -hmm. who may have been born and or raised in Europe, but who want to help change the African narrative and shine a positive light on it. What advice would I give them? Yeah. Find your people and then try and write without censoring yourself, because that's the biggest challenges our own scissors in our own head. So write as find out what really, really drives you and find a way to protect that and let the outside not come in. And when you have a draft, then trust that people can look at it and give you advice. But if you want to do something that's slightly different, I think you need to find a protected space for yourself first. Okay. Um, what would you say, um, if you're at all familiar with it, um, the Nigerian literature industry or you know landscape looks like right now i think it's really exciting there's lots of different um voices of course i'm a huge fan of cassava republic press not just because they are my publishers i was a fan of them before and i would have been a fan even if that said no and just because i'm trying to really push the board out there and do different things also in nigeria so they're not just as you're saying, different narrative, uh, different way of looking at African narratives. They're not just doing that for the European market, they're doing it mostly for the Nigerian market and then here as well. So I think it's great time, there's lots of exciting voices. I don't know so much how it is in Nigeria itself because I'm not there enough. So I, when I hear things, it's also again, I hear the stuff that comes over here and it gets attention right. here. What do you think um, the main issues faced, uh, facing African authors, especially the ones on the continent, but also the ones um, mm. here in the West um, th that they are facing right now in terms of getting their work published and read? I think here there's still a lot of ignorance about stories. And I think it, that's in general. If you're not coming from white middle class mainstream, you're considered marginal. And then people think, oh, I cannot read this because it's not about me, which is, of course, not right. It's not true because we read about men all the time when we're women. We read about, you know, other age groups that we're not part of, etc. But somehow it feels like a certain experience can only be sort of read by another experience, but if you're from the same experience and so you're sort of niched, which is a huge problem. I think that is one, to be allowed in. And I'm not interested in being allowed in, so it's more about, and that's what coming back to writing different narratives. It's like taking that space, being confident about it, but of course you need to then find the publishers who can support that. And I think on the continent, one of the biggest problems is the publishing houses and distribution. What I've learned is it's so difficult to distribute books and so expensive that sometimes it's easier to get the books, you know, from Nigerian author, get the books from London to another country in, the, in Africa rather than from Nigeria direct. And that's, that's, mm -hmm. that's crazy. So I think we have a lot of work to do. I think there is awareness, at least in the UK market, for diversity and the need of diversity. But there are always sort of initiatives and it's... I don't know that the whole landscape itself is changing. So that's a long way for all of us. You know, to, to take up space, insert ourselves in the space, to bring others up with us when we're getting somewhere, to leave the door open and to, to keep teaching that every story is valid, every story is a human story. So as long as you're a human, you can read that story and be moved by it. What would you say to, or what would you like readers, the audience, to um, do more? What would you like us? let me mm -hmm. include myself because mm -hmm. I'm a reader, uh, see, read more or do more or how can we help? What can we do? Just to be open and to maybe check your own prejudice. Again, when we're picking up things, you know, when you're picking up a book, not to immediately say, oh, that's not for me. And maybe why are you thinking that is for me? It's not for me. Sometimes it's really something that you don't like. There are certain genres I'm not crazy about. And sometimes it's just also what you've learned. Because not you personally, but we've learned to read middle-aged uh, white man's story. Yes. We've learned to, so we read that without ever thinking about it. And you've not read, you learn to read stories from, I don't know, Asian women who are doing certain th other things. So it's about checking your own prejudice and being open to stories but also to have fun, enjoy those stories. Mm -hmm. So if you had to give, let's say, four or five recommendations for people who are new to non-white 
um, stories, which ones would you recommend? Okay, let me have a um, quick thing. Mm -hmm. So, of course, first of all, is um, one of the ones I really admire is Chinula Paranta under the Udala tree. It's an excellent story um, that plays out during the Biafra War in Ni Nigeria. Um, someone from here, also of African descent, is Bernadine Evaristo. I think all of her work hugely important. But um, Girl, Woman, Other has just come out, and I think that's really, really important. Mm. They're going to end up all being Nigerians, which is, <laughs> which is wrong. Of course, your book. Of course, my <laughs> book. Of course. Okay. Um, I recently also read Aminata Fauna, Happiness, which I think is, is a fantastic. It's a beautiful read. Um, Pumla Gukola, who is a non-fiction writer, and I can't remember 100% what the book is called. Uh, in, inside a Feminist's Mind, I think. And, uh, and it's a lovely... Lovely is the wrong word. It's a strong, powerful voice on feminism from completely different angles. A South African writer. I'm hugely looking forward to Tessa McWatt's memoir called Shame on Me, An Anatomy of Belonging and Race. And I've read yeah. reviews on it. So I'm very interested in what she's done. And it's, I don't think it's a straightforward memoir. I think it has sort of essays and, again, looks at the myth that we tell around our own um, backgrounds and our own families and I think those are five for now and I'm going to kick myself later <laughs> for not having named that or this book <laughs> yeah it's always like that you always think mm. oh that's so great and then somebody asks you and then you forget yeah, yeah. Um, what are you currently reading currently I'm reading Amistad Mo Pen okay. and it's a very lovely summer read mm -hmm. um, but I'm about to read Titi Dangaremba This Mournable Body Mm. Oh, I've not read it, but yeah. I've heard a lot about it. Yeah, I have to start reading so it. So that's yeah. the next one in line. Lovely. Because this one is like a beach read. And yeah, then, yeah. In know. summer, it needs to be a little light, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and who would you say is your favorite author? My favorite author? Interesting. So I do... I maybe I have... Okay, I have a favorite book, which is Clarice Lispector, The Hour of the Star. And okay. because I'm interested in... I'm really interested in experimental literature. So that's one of my favorite books. In terms of all overall authors, I can't say because sometimes that's so overshadowed by who I know and who I kn and what I know they do as right. well, and then how mm -hmm. much I admire them as a whole package. Yeah. So, as and one person I do admire as a whole package for her talent, but also what she does is Bernadine Evaristo because she mm -hmm. she is an excellent writer. She's experimental but accessible, which I admire. But she also does a lot for diversity in writing and bringing people up. So that's one of the people definitely as a whole package I would I would name. Yeah, she was just nominated for the Man Booker Prize, wasn't exactly, she? So yeah. you must have been happy to see that. Yeah, I was very happy, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So um, stylistically, um, since you have a PhD in creative writing, so I'm sure you're interested in style, mm -hmm. um, who, if anybody, who influenced um, When We Speak of Nothing? Or what book influenced it? It's uh, I definitely, I can say that with conviction that it's not influenced by any book or anybody in that way. But what it comes from is voice. Really, I, ha I had the first chapter and it was very voice driven and that came very much from the young people that I encountered. I already talked about that. And making up a language that I could make that was sort of similar to how they spoke. Obviously they spoke differently. This is my literary version of it. And I... Um, I do come from performance, so I do work very much voice-based, something that I can hear and it's something that I can touch. But I am influenced by experimental writing. So even though you know I, I read a lot of Nigerians as well, there's a school of writing in the US called The New Narrative, which was maybe 70s, 80s or 90s. I'm not 100% sure when they were big, but the, they were very nerdy in their writing, so I'm quite influenced on certain things like that, looking at breaking text apart, breaking structures, what else can you do? At the same time, trying to be accessible, so it's not just an exercise, but people can also enjoy it. That makes a lot of sense, because when I uh, just started reading your book, I found the style very different, mm -hmm. but like you said, 
um, very accessible so it's not mm. like I didn't get it mm. but I thought hmm this is different and mm. then when you mentioned voice driven and I look back at how I felt when I was reading it I'm like hmm yeah that makes a lot of sense mm. because it's the voices that matter it's not like you have like a, an omniscient narrator who's just there and it's very somber and sinister yeah. you know no this is very different and you feel like you're in the lives yeah. and um, so yeah how um, in terms of reception how was it received your book when it first came out it's been out for a while it's now, been out two it? years um i think it was received very well i think there's there's a, once in a while there's somebody who um don't get it i don't think it's so much the voice i think it has to do with the intersectional uh, part so there's sometimes the criticism has been there's too many issues and i thought well the problem is these people do probably go out of the house and don't encounter all these things if i go out of the house i already have a few you know i'm already a black woman this and that and the other so in a way these are not issues I'm piling on. These are just characters we're living with their, in their intersectional lives. But it was, I think the voice was received very well. People generally liked it quite a lot. A lot of people loved it. Also people I didn't expect. So I have mm. quite a few, got quite a few emails from older white straight women who really, really felt the teenagers and really felt the voice and by the end of it felt that they had gotten an insight into what it means to be a you know a black or brown young man and I think the voice is that thing that you have to for some people it takes a little while until you fall into it and then you're in either you hate it or you're in at some point and mm -hmm. then that's it um. and that's quite similar to how I'm feeling right now at the beginning I was like hmm okay mm -hmm. and then it took me a little time to get used yeah. to the style and then once you're in it's really hard to get out <laughs> you know because so much happening all the <laughs> in time. the best way possible yeah, yeah, you know good, yeah. yeah so yeah good. I wanted to mm -hmm. know a bit that's why I asked you about the style because yeah. I was like hmm okay this is interesting <laughs> but it was in and it's interesting you said that because it was also a bit challenging for me to write it so because it was so fast and the voice is so fast so I had to keep that going and you can't sort of rest and then pull back and the lens is giving you that omniscient view and mm -hmm. mm, a little bit this and a little bit that. No, it had to be boom because you're in. You yeah. have to walk and then this one, that one, this. But yeah, um, yeah that's why you redraft and edit, etc. And the characters' lives, they are also not slow and paced. They are, you mm -hmm. know, chaotic, fast, different mm -hmm. things happen really quickly. So I feel like the style really reflects that really well. Thank really you. I like yeah. that. What is next for you as um, a writer? What projects are you working on or uh, will you be working on? Is there anything in particular we can look forward to? Yeah, I'm writing on the next level. It's a little bit slow and it was slow because, you know, I have a toddler and mm -hmm. it's just getting, I'm just getting to the stage where I can carve out more time. I'm going to be a writer in residence at um, Greenwich University for the next two semesters. So that gives me a good chunk of time to concentrate on that and I hope if not the whole draft that I get quite quite a lot done while I'm there. So yeah, next novel and then I have some ideas for some non-fiction and a novella. So we'll see how much I can get done quickly. Amazing. So um, you already mentioned it. If people want to keep up with you, Twitter is the best way, right? Twitter is the best way. Yeah, Twitter is the best way. Okay. I do check. I just don't tweet very much. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> OK, so last question. It's an either or. Okay. You have to pick. <laughs> Nigerian food or German food? Oh, Nigerian. <laughs> <laughs> Any time. No question, yeah? No. But it's, uh, you know why? Because I moved to Nigeria when I was one, mm. and I, I came back to Germany when I was five, five and a half. So all my former, you know, when I started eating, mm -hmm. that's all in Nigeria. So mm -hmm. when German food came, I was like, what is this? <laughs> no? So no, no shade to German food. If it's your taste, you know, it's no, all right. No shade if it's your taste. Not <laughs> really, come on. Yeah. So what's your favorite Nigerian dish? Egusi and Amala. Okay, I, I second you on the Egusi, the Amala, I'm not so sure. I'm, I'm partial to Pando, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a quiet taste. Yes, it's an acquired taste. But, um, okay, so thank you so much for mm -hmm. taking the time to do this. And um, yeah, we'll keep an eye on your Twitter so we know what's coming. Thank, thank you so you. much. <laughs>